All right, welcome back to Theater 3, Introduction to Theater. This is our acting lecture. I um, hope you guys have a lot of fun with this. There are a few clips where we get to watch some brilliant acting. Hope you guys enjoy that. Once again, if you have any questions or comments or just want to participate in some kind of lively discussion, uh, go ahead and <clears throat> head on to Canvas and start a discussion with your classmates and me, and I'd love to respond to those questions as a collective in your, in your classrooms. Um, yeah, I'd really love to see you participate. Uh, just to start out, this is Judy Dench, an amazing actor. I just, whenever I think of like acting and the craft of acting, I think of those original, like um, the Royal Shakespeare Company people like uh, Ian McKellen and, and Patrick Stewart and Ben Kingsley. And Judy Dench is one of those um, that has studied the craft of acting before it was kind of cool. Um, so yeah, she's she's a really brilliant performer. This is her as Viola in Twelfth Night on in a Shakespeare play. We're going to be reading some Shakespeare in this class. Uh, I would highly recommend going ahead and starting that that Midsummer Night's Dream reading now to get to get a leg up on on everybody else because it is kind of hard work and and to act Shakespeare is kind of the 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 apex of of difficult acting. So the best part about all of this is that you can get better that you can you can understand these things even if it seems like something that's just so out of reach or just so complicated that that there's no way that you could do it i promise you uh you can learn and you can learn to be a good actor you can learn to be an amazing actor it just takes some time and most young actors wonder what what's the key what's the special sauce there and it really is just kind of years of hard work and study and being patient with yourself and learning these these techniques and to study them in some kind of conservatory program and then going out there and and practicing just doing it over and over and over again if you have a goal or or a desire to start acting on film or in television you're in a perfect place here in california uh to go out there in la and start doing some background work some some extra some extra work or going to auditions and hitting those, those television um, film and commercial auditions because there are plentiful. And even though everyone in LA wants to be an actor, uh, it is some good practice and it's something that you could learn and apply to many different uh, facets of life. So great. Uh, I have a couple clips here and the first one that I wanted to show you first off, first off is Fences. Uh, August Wilson is the playwright here. And you may have seen this movie, you may have not, uh, it's it's an incredible film. It's based off of a play, a stage play um, that took place, that takes place in, in around the 60s in that Jim Crow era. And Denzel Washington is incredible in this scene with a young actor uh, who, who portrays his son. And I want you guys to just go ahead and click the link in the description, check out this Fences scene, and please tell me what you think in the description. I want you guys to pay attention to the way these two actors listen to each other, the way that they're patient, the way that they, they interact and, and wait for those moments. They wait for the stimulus to hit them. There's a moment where Denzel Washington hits him on the chest. I want you to pay attention to the young actor and how he responds to that stimulus of being hit on the chest by his father, okay? So go ahead and pause this video and come right back and we'll talk about it a little bit more. So welcome back. It was. Just, an, just a great scene. I'm, I'm a big fan of Denzel Washington in general, but I think this is just some incredible writing and um, he's, just, he's just a presence. The one thing that I always ask young actors when I show them this scene is, is what are you noticing? What are you noticing about his demeanor, about his presence? And they all say kind of the same thing is that they feel like he doesn't work very hard. He's not like putting on a character. And that's really important. Um, when you become this high profile kind of celebrity actor like like Viola Davis or, or um, Denzel Washington, really you are interesting enough. And that's the one thing I, I, I try to hammer into uh, a lot of young actors is, is the idea that you are good enough, you are interesting enough to just exist on camera and that you don't have to spend a lot of time acting or overacting. Denzel Washington has spent years perfecting a craft and he has studied many of the techniques that we will be talking about in this, in this lecture um, himself. And he's done it throughout the years and he's just getting better and better. So uh, it's a pleasure to see him work. 
in your book, uh, by the way, this is uh, chapter five in your in your books. In case you wanted to follow along, please study this chapter and make sure that you are um, up to date on all the terms because uh, it's all fair game on the test in the in the chapter. So anything in chapter five and about the actor, it is all fair game here. So acting in life versus acting on stage. This is uh, in your book. It, it it portrays basically two types of daily acting. And the first one is imitation and the next one is role playing. And take a look at this, this young, this young child pretending to be a doctor. Where did, I think this is, this is a young girl. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, but where did she learn how to, to use a stethoscope? Like where, where do we pick these things up? When, when do we learn how to do something like that? Because this, uh, this child can't be more than, I don't know, five, five or six. Um, and yet they, they understand the complex nature or at least like the, the tangible nature of this tool and the idea that it, it is used to heal someone or to, or to is it's what a healing practitioner would use a stethoscope. She maybe doesn't completely understand what it's for or, or what it's used um, for exactly, but she knows its purpose. She knows the idea and all she is doing is just imitating this idea, imitating the action of healing her little teddy bear. Now let's take a look at this over here, role playing and taking on a role, taking on a different type of, of character, putting on something that is not you acting the doctor, um, acting, in a period play, like these, these kids obviously are not born in this time period, but putting on the nature of that time period and like what kids were like back then. You really have to put yourself in a more, more childlike mentality and, and kind of this naivete, this, this naive, naive childlike attitude when we approach acting so that we turn off the inner voice that tells us this is stupid and that it is, it's all pretended, it's, it's fake. Um, shut that voice down and, and just play for a second. Put yourself in the shoes of someone else. I often tell people to engage in activities like Dungeons and Dragons or something like that to get an idea of what it's like to step in the, the shoes of, of a character or play a video game that, that's role-playing based where you get a chance to, to not be yourself for two seconds and to be someone completely different. And what are the circumstances underneath those um, those instances in the video game. So um, just a small note that your book book highlights here, the classical acting, the overdramatic and stage acting versus um, what we see today, which is realism. It's the style of realism, which is um, two characters acting in a scene like we're seeing right here um, versus me talking to you in such a direct address manner. This is me presenting a scene to you. So if I were to say, um, if I were to perform a monologue, a Shakespearean monologue, like friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often tarred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. I am not really presenting this monologue as a scene. It's more like direct address. I'm breaking that fourth wall, that aesthetic distance with you over this, this little camera that I'm presenting today. So, Instead of it being an intimate scene with someone else, with, with, uh, with your scene partner, me and, me and this book are having a scene and you guys are observing the scene. Make sense? So that changed throughout the years. It used to be in classical acting, this overdramatic and staged version of what we see today in a realistic scene like our Fences scene that we just watched. Instead of, you know, Denzel Washington breaking that fourth wall and speaking to him. Uh, what law says that I, I got to like you? Yeah. So good. Three objectives of acting. Um, and this is obviously just uh, subjective and everyone have, has a different objective when it comes to acting. Many different teachers and practitioners of acting will tell you different things, but I think of the crux of it is believability. We want to, we want to believe what's happening on stage. We want, we want to forget that we're watching something and then just totally be immersed in, in the story of the production. Physical acting. Um, 
learning to differentiate between what's going on in your body out of nerves and anxiety versus what's really happening in the character. When Andy Serkis portrayed Gollum in, in Lord of the Rings, he was not concerned with looking silly or looking stupid. He was completely physically uh, realized as this, this little creature, this, this tiny Gollum creature on all fours, just kind of walking back and forth. That physicality really brought a realness to his acting. And the synthesis of an integration of the inner and outer life of this actor, which means um, what's going on in here is presenting outwardly. So at any point when you guys are watching a play and watching a good performance of an actor, the, the sign of a really good actor is when they're not speaking at all and you still understand what they want and what their driving force is. That can kind of be hard. That's hard to explain and hard to, to talk about in, over, over this um, recorded lecture. But think about those, those moments where you're watching your favorite shows or watching your favorite TV series and the character is silent, but you're still going, oh no, don't go in there. Or, oh, he's thinking about doing something really bad. Or she is, she's on this war path that is just in, like, we can't escape this moment. And it kind of, it stirs up either excitement or, or joy or frustration or anger. Any performer that can get you to feel those things, they're doing a good job. The actors that make you feel like you hate them, those are good actors, not, not poor actors. Like it, you may dislike the, the material, you may dislike the, the show in general, but an actor that can get you to feel those kind of things, that's a good actor. So here's another clip. This is from Gangs of New York. I want you guys to go ahead and click the link in the description. Or if you're just watching this, um, you're going through this, this PowerPoint on your own, you can just click, click this um, little sign that says Gangs of New York. He'll send you straight to that scene. Check out, this is Daniel Day-Lewis, who is, who is widely known as, as a method actor. And a method actor we'll talk about here in just a second. But um, he's pretty intense as a person. And notice in this scene how much time both of them take and in his eyes and in his demeanor and his, in his physicality and that those wheels grinding in, in his brain that you're able to kind of see through both of these characters, the Leonardo DiCaprio character and um, the Bill the Butcher character. Um, I want you to see the Daniel, Daniel Day-Lewis. I was trying to think of his actor name. Um, I want you to see their inner life, the inner and outer synthesis the, integra the integration of the inner and outer life that they have going on. Go ahead and pause this video and come right back. We'll, we'll talk about it, okay? So welcome back. Uh, really great scene. Um, lots of conflict here. And that's at the essence of all of the good acting scenes that are written on stage and on screen. It all has to do with some kind of conflict, some kind of thing that, that they are in opposition to. If there's no conflict, if there's no, nothing to, to keep them from butting heads, then, then why are we watching it? You know, nobody wants to watch a play or, or, or a show about someone going to the grocery store and then nothing happens. We want to see messy things, right? We want to see, we want to see people mess up. We want to see uh, violence or, or um, some kind of uh, mistake or some character struggling to get through their their circumstance even if it's just like a romantic comedy or something like that we got to see the breakup we got to see what happens to this character before that before they get married before something happens and they're they're taken care of at that point so this character or this person that you're looking at right now his name is Konstantin Stanislavski um, also known as the father of modern realism that realism um, genre that we talked about before he's kind of the first guy to think about um, changing the ideas. Um, so he came up with, he, he's, he's a businessman, grew up in Russia, in um, St. Petersburg and, and Moscow, Russia. And uh, he went to see a play because he really enjoyed theater. And he saw this young woman performing and he thought she was brilliant. So he brought all of his friends back and he says, you guys got to see this woman. She's an amazing performer. And then she totally bombed and it was not that good. And then in classic Russian fashion, he followed her out of that theater into, into an alleyway. And he said, you know, what happened? And she said, I, I don't understand. What are you talking about? He says, 
you were so good the other night and I brought all my friends here to see your performance and now you, you were just awful. And she says, oh, I wasn't feeling it tonight or it wasn't, it wasn't affecting me like it was the other night. And he, this, this idea really frustrated Stanislavski and he started thinking about there's got to be a scientific way to get an, an actor from a conscious level of trying to act and then all of a sudden it just becomes second nature and you can reproduce that performance every single time that you're on stage and so he developed the moscow art theater and he created an acting technique that was called the stanislavski system this is not to be confused with method acting and a lot of people who think of stanislavski they think that he created the method or the acting method and the method is, if you guys haven't heard of it before, the method is essentially um, when an actor really starts living in their, circum their character's circumstances. So let's say that you're going to portray a character who is um, a drug dealer. Well, you would have never sold drugs before, and so you need to go out there and try to use some drugs and try to sell some drugs just to get into the mind frame of this character. And that technique is very dangerous and can cause a lot of problems and really doesn't help you all that much. So whenever I think of, of um, method actors in that kind of sense, I, I think it's a misrepresentation of who he is and what he was trying to do. Um, that's more Lee Strasberg and it's Amer an American technique, not this Russian technique that was, that was created originally. So when you're asked on the test about who Stanislavski was and what he developed, do not say he developed the method. Okay, that's a no-no. These are some of the elements that he created. He created 16 elements of acting, and we're not going to do all of those. Uh, we're going to do six. I'm going to do six of them, six of the main pieces. And there are many more complicated um, pieces to his, his technique and his system. But we're going to talk about some of the most important ones and, and, and highlight some of these that are very important for actors. To, to focus on. The first one is concentration. Uh, then we'll go into relaxation, given circumstances, magic if, objective, and action. I want you to pay attention to these little, um, these little icons that I gave them because they kind of highlight what they mean and what they're for, just to kind of give you a, a mental image of what those elements are. Because on the test, you'll have to remember all of these and ha have to identify them. It's a big part of the test. So concentration is essentially just your inner focus. It's the focus of, of what you should be thinking of in the moment on stage. Because when you're there, when you're in the moment and on stage and all of a sudden your mom shows up with her new boyfriend and you're going like, oh, how dare she bring it? Like those kind of thoughts, they cannot be interfering with all of the lines that you have to memorize. You're blocking your movement. Um, the moments to moments, if you're in a musical, remembering all the musical notes that you have to say. So this is the number one element of the Stanislavski system. If, if you can get down a concentrated nature or if you can be focused enough to, um, to act on stage, you're on your way. This is the most difficult for young actors. And I spend most of my time in acting classes trying to get through um, to this area of expertise of concentration. And it takes months sometimes for a young actor, a young person to kind of forget all of the problems in the world, all of the things plaguing their, their circumstances and to just forget. And all of a sudden they develop this sense of existing in this moment as their character and with their partner on stage. It's a pretty amazing feeling once you get get a sense of what that what that's like. The only other people that I've really talked to who, well, there are there are a couple um, other different types of people that can feel this. Athletes and musicians all experience the kind of same sensation of the zone, like feeling like you're in the zone. So if you guys have ever played a sport or have been in in been in the zone, or if you've you've performed in in a violin um, concerto or you were in band or, or orchestra and you've ever felt just like totally immersed of that feeling of just you and your instrument or you on the field of, of, a, of an athletic event, that's the same feeling that actors should be feeling on stage, that concentrated zone feeling. So good. 
I usually do some kind of exercise with people in class uh, that is a really intense concentration exercise called typewriter. If you guys are interested in knowing more about that, uh, you can email me or you can just research it on, on online. I'm sure you'll be able to find an exercise in a YouTube video about typewriter and concentration exercise. The next one I wanted to talk about is relaxation. This is um, learning how to develop that idea of tension versus relaxation, your muscular tension versus relaxation. That's the, those are the magic words that I want to see on the test. Um, the sensation of feeling muscular tension and re muscular relaxation in tandem, feeling them together. Like most of us don't know how high we're keeping our shoulders next to our ears until all of a sudden we realize how loose, what loose relaxation can feel like in the tense shoulders and arms and in our neck, and in our jaw, in our lips. Are you currently aware of the, um, the injuries or um, the, the illness that you're currently going through? Like right now, I bit my lip not too long ago, so I'm hyper aware of, of what's happening right here in my lower lip. And um, it's just kind of, it's, an, it's influencing a lot of this side of my face. And I'm just, I'm hyper aware of that. When I'm on stage, it's, it's going to continually um, be a focus of mine. And it's going to take some of that concentration away. So actors spend a lot of their time, especially student actors, they will develop these voice and movement techniques to make sure that their voice is well supported and that their muscles are free of tension and that they are released. They, they at least know the feeling of release so that they can recreate a really tense moment or some tense actions if they're supposed to fight in a scene, they really got to know what it, what it feels like to be physically engaged violently with another person. What, what does that feel like? If you're cleaning a sink, like how much action are you putting behind the arms? Like how much effort are we putting onto our, our muscles? So yeah, that's very important for us to remember to help us uh, generate some physical believability. Our given circumstances are the facts of the play. They're what's going on in our life. So look at all of these different people in this picture. Um, so many things that could bring them together. So many things that, can, that they can relate to each other with. But so many things that make them unique and different. Um, they, none of them live the same life. And their circumstances are all different from one another. Some of them might be going through a divorce. Some of them might be going through um, a death in their family. Some of them might be, might be going through puberty or some of them might be um, uh, sick or ill. You don't know. In the play, these facts are given to you as, as cliff notes, like almost as like a, it's a hint. If you're sick or like you, you just got into a car accident, so you may not walk as fast as everyone else is going to walk. You really need to pay attention to those given circumstances. Are you an angry person? Where does that anger come from? Are you, are you looking for revenge or something like that? Or did someone slight you somehow? Um, are you a happy person? What is it about your life that makes you cheerful and happy? Um, those are the given circumstances in the play that your character may be going through. And as an actor, it's your responsibility to take note of all of those things. I lost my mother when I was age four. So maybe my, maybe my circumstances are that I, I'm really awkward about mother characters or I'm, I'm seeking out a motherly figure in my life. Just those kind of things matter. And playwrights, when they're writing these kind of plays, they're, they're thinking about those when they write their characters. They're thinking about what these given circumstances mean for you, okay? They are the facts of the play. Don't forget that. The magic if. I like to refer to this as what would you do or what would Jesus do? So if you say that on the play or if you say that on the test, if I ask you to define what the magic if is, you can say what would Jesus, what would Jesus do? And I will accept that. I'll accept that. Um, which way are you going to go? Like what, what would you do specifically? Not you the character. What would you as the actor do in the circumstance? If someone... If someone, um, I don't know, stole your luggage or, or someone um, treated you badly, how fast would you forgive them? How fast would you forgive them? 
And think about that for a second. Think, let that wash over you before you make a decision for your character. Remember that most of us are pretty similar. That I mean, none of us have ever killed somebody. At least I, I hope you, you haven't. Um, but most of us have never experienced the idea of, of a person's life in our hands. So I think when sometimes when people go through an objective, and we'll get to that word in here in a second, and they go through what they should be doing, they often say, oh, I would kill that person. I was like, would you really? You would really kill that person? Well, probably not, but maybe you'd want to hurt them. Yeah. So put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in their shoes and say, like, what would I do? What, what would be the worst case, best case scenario here be? And then work from there. An objective, and I used Batman in this situation just to kind of like go through um, objective and action because objective and action kind of go hand in hand. So there are two types of objectives. The first is what's called a super objective, and that's what the character wants more than anything in the world. And here's a discussion I'd love to hear from you guys. I'd love to hear from you about what Batman's super objective is. What do you think Batman's super objective is? What do you think he wants more than anything in the whole world? Yeah? And I promise you, maybe it's not as easy as you think. I would love to hear from people and love to see this debate happen about like what is, what's, what's at the very heart of his desires and needs and wants? What does he want? An objective is what do you want? A super objective is what do you want more than anything in the world? If you were to get a, a, a genie to grant you one wish, what would that one wish be? Yeah, what would it be? In the, and then the second objective that you need to worry about is what's your scene objective? What do you want from your scene partner in this specific scene? Like what's, what, does, what does Batman want from the Joker? Well, he wants information, right? But how is he going to get that information is the next question. What type of action does he use to get that information? And is he successful? Who wins in this scene? Do you guys know anything about the Dark Knight? You know who wins the scene, who, who, who ends up accomplishing their mission, who ends up accomplishing their desires. And make no mistake about it, the Joker has an objective too. If you are existing as an actor on stage with someone else, you must have an objective. That should be the number one focus. That's, that's the concentration thing that you should be thinking about constantly. What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? How am I getting what I want? Where, how am I going about it? The action is what we do to get to our objective. What action do you take? And it can be a psychological action. It can be a physical action. A psychological action is something like, um, you know, making fun of somebody, degrading somebody. That's an action. An, an action could also be like flirting with someone, right? Have we ever tried to get something that we wanted by flirting with someone? I'm sure you have. Very interesting thought, right? So here is a great scene. Um, I, I love this scene. There's a lot of yelling in it and I'm not sure I would necessarily make that choice, but it gets to this point in this movie. If you guys haven't seen this movie, there is just about a married couple. And uh, at the climax of this scene, they come together and they start really degrading each other and their objectives become pretty clear what they're trying to do. And then it kind of shifts and then you, you, you realize that maybe it's not as simple as you thought it was before. Maybe they don't hate each other as much, but there's a lot of anger in their given circumstances. There's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure. So go ahead and pause this video and check this out under the description and come right back. And I'll, I'll talk about your, your homework here in just a second. Okay, great. Welcome back guys. So did you notice some objective and action work there? Did you, did you see them pursuing an objective? Did you see some actions being taken? Did you see the moment where Adam Driver really gets in Scarlett Johansson's face and starts yelling at her and making her feel like she's less or smaller than she actually is? Did you see Scarlett Johansson really playing a lot of these off as a joke, just laughing it off like he's pathetic and, and um, really hurting his spirit? with that kind of action, that degrading action to make him feel like he's worthless, like he's, like he's lazy. And him trying to make her feel like she's, she's a dragon, like she's some kind of terrible human being. Really intense scene to, to watch. So here's your assignment. Um, 
I, I believe the due date is going to be during the weekend. Um, just make sure that you submit this, this assignment um, to me before the end of the weekend so I can show you guys on Monday what, what you guys created. I'll kind of like cut them together and edit them and, and, and show you guys uh, via, via this, this platform. So I want you guys to perform a monologue that's located on Canvas. It's from Goodbye Charles, which is a one act play. I highly recommend you finding as much information as you can about this. Um, and yeah, just remember that knowledge is power. Learn about your given circumstances that will flavor who you are as a person. I know it's a woman speaking here. Just pretend, who cares? Who cares if it if it's a man speaking to another man, if it's a woman speaking to another woman, if it's a man speaking to a woman, it doesn't really matter. I don't, I don't care what you, how you decide to say this, this, this monologue, just keep the words all the same. Don't change any words. Okay. What can you do to make this monologue convincing? How can you apply the Stanislavski technique, the Stanislavski system to help you develop a character in this monologue? Um, I said this at the beginning, um, someone asked the question about it being memorized. You do not have to memorize this. You can just read it straight off your screen like I'm reading um, this assignment here. Um, just make sure that you stay engaged. Read through it a couple times before you record it. Yeah, practice it a bit. Go through it a couple times with your roommate, with your mom, your dad, wh whoever is with you, your brother, sister, your spouse. Um, practice it with somebody. Get some feedback. Let them tell you what they see. Um, and then try to put an objective behind it and use some of those actions, use some of those psychological actions to help you get uh, more interesting. Um, what are the challenges of this monologue? I'd love to hear that at the end of your recording. So what I want you to do is I want you to record this either on your phone or here on Zoom or whatever and just record it, um, upload it somehow on an MP, uh, on an MP4 or upload it to YouTube and send me the link or something like that. Um, however you do it, you can even you can even do it on Instagram and send me the link, whatever I can, however I can watch it. I'd just love to see you do that. And just answer these questions after your monologue is done. Talk about how it was challenging, how you, how you applied your technique, and then share it, okay? And then I'm gonna piece it together and hopefully, um, yeah use that, use, use those clips and share it with the class. Okay. It's just easier if you send me the file, if there's somehow you can share me, share like a Google drive so I can, I can use those clips and edit them together. That would help me. But if YouTube link is fine too, or Instagram or something like that, uh, whatever you decide to do. Okay. So any questions you can always email me and let me know what's going on. Please participate in the discussion forum. I'd love to hear from you guys. Okay. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.